Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Rubber Industry Tech Talk. It's a technology activity. Today we're all here for this uh, topic on the improving prediction of rubber compound formulation, graph compounder case studies. And this presentation given by Dr. Hank Jochen Graf. As you know, this uh, program is managed by Technobase. We do have a partners okay, to support this program. Um, I'd like to thank all partners at Rubber World. And Rubber World is a 130, for, or 130 plus years old magazine, especially in the rubber technology. Uh, it's a free to subscribe. You can subscribe at rubberworld.com. And also we have other magazine, Rubber and Tire Digest, which is joint publication of Technobase and Rubber World. You can also subscribe to free in a digital format, uh, rubbertiredigest.com. And also it's important technology channel, rubber industry network, and also rubber technologist to global network. I welcome you all and I thank you for this supporting this uh, our program today. Uh, for the benefit of all the audience, I may I would like to provide you a brief overview about the technologies, what kind of services we are offering for the rubber industry. It's a short video with a slideshow. Uh, please bear with me to show you uh, this uh, presentation on technologies. And that's about the Technobase. I'm hoping that all of you have a rich understanding about Technobase and what kind of services we offer uh, for the rubber industry. We have a broad range of services, uh, not only education, business development, and I think you can get a good picture of it. Um, so now we are here for the, the program on the today's talk, Rubber Industry Tech Talk. And the topic is on the improving prediction of the rubber compound formulation, graph component 
case studies. So this is by Dr. Han Jochen Graf. And uh, Dr. Ja Han Jochen Graf, he has more than 45 years experience and with in, in the compounding, material development, processing. And he also trains the people in, in, with, uh, with the industry people, so a core training program. And um, he developed this uh, graph compounder program, which is a very useful tool um, for the people who have developed formulations. And today, Dr. Graf will be talking about how to improve the prediction of the rubber compound formulation. Dr. Graf, over to you. Let me ask you to share your screen. So welcome from my side uh, to this seminar, which is the second one in a row uh, of um, a graph compounder introduction and explanation how to use that. And now we want to discuss how we improve the prediction of rubber compound formulations. And this should be supported or want we to support with some case studies. So the content of this webinar would be why we need uh, improving the prediction, wh why we do that in this form and why, why we need that, and a little bit about analysis of data. Uh, we know that we do that statistically was uh, uh, in a DOE schematic, uh, design of experiments system. And here we want to expand that a little bit with so-called correlation analysis, which we can do in both systems in the design of experiment software, uh, at least in some and uh, with the graph compounder as well. And then I would show how that works in some case studies, which I have uh, at the moment uh, finished so far, and we will end with a conclusion. Um, sorry. So what what we have on on data? Is, is a question and how we use that. That was the origin of the invention of the graph compounder software. Because with the massive data everywhere in, uh, in the industry, in uh, personal uh, reach or in literature, we have an, an, a huge knowledge base but we have a limited use if we try systematically to investigate that or, or uh, try to extract the knowledge from that. So what we do in practice is that we do experimentation again, 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 and this way we spend a lot of money. So, and uh, in the graph compounder, we have already a tutorial uh, files, which are samples out of uh, the literature, for example, or uh, yeah, mostly out of the literature. And that is deals with NR, with EPDM, and with other polymers. And this is a very short data set and uh, we said you can already practice. Uh, sorry. My mouse is a little bit too fast, so I take the, the uh, other things. So when we talk about uh, correlations, in uh, then we uh, look back to the uh, science of rubber and how uh, 
um, properties have to fit together. Here you see a correlation that is hardness and modulus 300 in on the uh, left side. And you see there's somehow a fair correlations, at least you acknowledge that there is some correlation. It's not good, so a correlation coefficient will probably be low. And then when you do another graph where you have a correlation, a scatter plot of tensile over elongation, then you see by sudden there is no correlation. And then we have asked ourselves, would there a correlation? Or is it really uh, to accept that there is nothing? So what is actually a correlation? Uh, to be clear on what we are trying to do. So it's first of all a statistical measure. And that describes that two variables are related to each other. Is not meaning that there is a relation uh, which you can uh, describe analytically. Yes, we are in pure statistic. So we can create a graph, we can create a regression line and we can create a correlation coefficient. And uh, this is only statistic meaning. So we have no cause and effect yet identified, uh, which uh, describes this type of relationship. That is very important, yes, because we need to do that actually in step two. So now with this slide, I want to remind you on uh, an, a famous graph that was uh, published by Daniel Herz in Elastomerics 84. And he took that from a booklet, uh, Technology, Science in Technology and Baba and uh, Koran uh, uh, has published that in a in the uh, uh, in the chapter about vulcanization in ninety four, and that describes the dependency of properties from crosslink density. And just let me say, crosslink density is some sort of a master um, a term in rubber industry. And what you see here is that some properties are linear dependent from crosslink density. Yes, and some properties are nonlinear dependent from crosslink density. For example, the tear strength, fatigue life, toughness, and things like that. At least when you see this type of graph, you should see as well that if there are linear dependency, for example, hardness and static modulus in an uh, experimentation series, they should show some correlation. Yes, and then I have uh, here some linear correlation as set to hardness and modulus, I can add this uh, dynamic modulus. And the nonlinears are, for example, tensile tear, hysteresis, permanent set, friction, and probably uh, properties after aging. So it, the point is for this presentation here that if that's true, we can have beyond the statistics of an uh, experimental design, 
uh, a tool to improve our data. In uh, uh, other uh, chart here where the uh, correlation between loading and physical properties is described. So you have here tensile versus carbon black loading. You see that uh, tensile depends in a nonlinear way from the carbon black loading and it's also different uh, for different uh, carbon blacks with uh, different uh, uh, surface activity. But if you go at a definite loading up here, yes, you would then suggest there's at least some room for a linear correlation. And when we uh, investigate now uh, a little bit deeper uh, correlations here, so we see that there is a linear correlation with hardness and static modulus, uh, and there is a nonlinear uh, correlation as uh, in the previous slide from tensile and tear. Well, that's very basic things we need to remind ourselves to uh, understand what I want to say in the following. So we, when we see the stress strain curve, yes, here's a very schematic um, drawing of the stress strain. So that's this tension over elongation. <clears throat> then normally we take uh, the uh, modulus at low elongation a little bit as a sign for crossing density, which moves up um, slowly with the uh, activity of the filler. Yes, and the difference between this modulus or even better the Young's modulus with an elongation as a 300% elongation, yes, in the past we took as a measure for crosslink density. So what is uh, pointed out here is that there should be a correlation at least between modulus at lower uh, elongation and the modulus at higher elongation. And that is in conjunction with the energy at break, for example. And uh, so at least we should see here when we have an, an, an uh, data which are accidentally uh, composed of an, an, an data set, is yes, that the modulus should be somehow correlated to each other. <clears throat> so why is that so important? Yeah, when we go in statistic experimental design, Yes, and we have the statistics uh, to decide whether we have a significant influence of a factor on a response. So, for example, of a carbon black on uh, the modulus. Then we uh, argue with uh, uh, the <clears throat> distribution of data and how good that will fit by a regression line or a regression curve is a second order. In a diagram here, as shown here, as um, for example, the modulus 100 over modulus 300, <clears throat> yes, we, we judge uh, with our view on the accuracy of, or the, the a good fit on a regression line which we can place here uh, in, in with our imagination yes and then when we do that we see immediately oh there are here some points sticking out and uh, the question is is it possible to 
take these points out and um, this way improve the correlation and then finally uh, um, can use this clean database and for better prediction. <clears throat> Sorry. So if you see now hardness over modulus, as we know as uh, technologies that uh, this uh, modulus represents a portion which comes from the crosslink density as a little bit explained very briefly with the stress strain curve and the other um, portion comes from the crosslink density then there should be at least as in some sort of integral property um, existing a hardness over modulus 300 as well so and when you compare both curves you see there is a larger scatter of uh, in the graph of the hardness over modulus 300 and then the question is why is that is that is that this way is that natural or is that actually due to our experimentation and lack of precision so here i have now put in the graph the regression line <clears throat> on the left side yes and indicated uh, two points which i would then say they could be possibly outliers or they are not fitting in this uh, correlation and from this i can now uh, investigate these two compounds or take them just out so both possibilities are there if i do that of course yes then you see that my regression line would shift yeah that so all if, if i work that way yes and i eliminate something i need to do my regression analysis a, again without this point which i eliminated and then i would come in, in terms of uh, statistic experimental design <clears throat> to an adjusted conclusion and in this case when we clean data, yes, with a certain distance from this regression line, I can do that in my program by a mouse click. And then I see those uh, uh, compounds name. And with that, then I can go in the uh, database and then um, right click on the name and then eliminate that and then i refresh the graph so that is two mouse clicks away in uh, experimental design yes i need actually to eliminate only this date from that compound um, is this an exercise you can do on the other hand uh, your compound in 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 total is uh, suspicious because normally uh, one measurement error could be um, <clears throat> accompanied by uh, other measurement errors or the the compound in itself has some problem uh, due to variation coming from some some sources so then we should remind ourselves what is accuracy and what is precision yes and uh, in this uh, scheme i have taken from a uh, very nice publication in elastomerics from 83 <clears throat> i see that uh, on the right side yes i have poor accuracy and poor precision you see a larger scatter around uh, the target and when i go uh, to the left side yes 
I improve my accuracy and still my precision is poor, yes, because I have a larger scatter around my target. <clears throat> and you see when all my data are, let me say, in certain range, I have a good precision, but I missed the, uh, uh, the target. So my accuracy is poor. And then if I'm inside uh, the, the target with a short distance and all my points are somehow uh, near to each other, then I have good accuracy. So, and the problem here is that we are in practice, we are not paying enough attention to that. That means uh, if I'm backwards analyzing a lot of DOEs, uh, statistic experimental design, which I have in my life, and uh, I use this uh, uh, simple correlation technique, I was a bit shocked about the precision and accuracy uh, we are not seeing in the statistics of uh, this way only in the correlation graphs and in the uh, in the uh, predicted versus actual uh, uh, curve so i need to to show in in certain graphs um, and the, the statistic values are uh, not a good guidance for uh, precision and accuracy so where all this influences disturbing our accuracy and precision. And uh, that's what we need to think about, for example, when we do our experimentation, mostly in a laboratory mixing machine. Yes, we have some sort of, let me say, standard practice. First of all, most of laboratory machines are much less equipped than mixing machine in a production. So you can have uh, uh, access, you, you have less access to good data out of this machine. Mostly a machine is very old <clears throat> because it's not productive, yes, from the standpoint of an investment. And then you have raw materials which you get from somewhere, you have a lot of raw materials uh, to manage and they can be pretty old yes and when you need a, a, a fast test and answer for something yes and you you then searching for raw material and you would then take what you have in your warehouse in your laboratory where shelf and that is maybe out of date or whatever yes i see that in practice that is an and type of problem which because we are forced to keep the cost in the laboratory down so that will give us some uh, influences on precision and accuracy so and then we have our standard test protocols and here's a question when we do three samples i think that is mostly used in the in the world that way yes is that enough? Do we not should do more? In other terms, when you do statistic experimental design, yes, and then the software asks you anyhow, you should have some repeats. And mostly people, uh, let me say, scale that a little bit down instead of five uh, repeats. Yes, they do two or three. And I myself, I did that as well is actually mostly one then you have your gauge rnr study hopefully done yes that you know exactly what type of measurement error you have in each test i'm not sure if it's that's done everywhere so i talked about already the repeats and to improve accuracy and precision Yes, we offer since a long time, so 
to organize around robbing testing. That is an institute in Germany, for Germany, which is uh, doing that. And uh, here you should train your laboratory staff in precision and accuracy that they finally know exactly where they are and what needs to improve. I make a conclusion here, yes, because I found some friends in industry and asked them, what do you do for precision? What is the problem uh, when I'm saying that we need to improve precision? Yes. And uh, the answer was from all of them. Yeah, we know that problem. Yes. And uh, is this complicated? So we are cautious with interpretation of data and uh, we try to do some more than comparing A and B compound uh, because the question, what is the measurement error when you compare that is a significantly different, is mostly cannot be answered this way. So let's do an example here from uh, a literature which is published. At least it is uh, made in 98 from uh, my friend Rajamvara <clears throat> with some uh, uh, colleagues. And that was a very um, challenging uh, screening test because of the lot of um, factors chosen, and that is the E and B content, the alpha, and the uh, some accelerators. And with this here, um, I uh, investigated for the first time, or uh, investigated this repeatedly. Excuse me for that. Um, and I saw the problem, first of all, to manage experiments with 48 recipes to do in a lab in a short uh, time frame. And then um, stay ahead with uh, all the arguments we had already exchanged. So when you do the type of uh, scatter plot, in this case, for example, you plot um, uh, a tensile over elongation at break, you see immediately that you have some sort of correlation, yes? But you see also there are a lot of data which are not fitting very well the uh, imagined com, uh, regression line. And you see here my R square, my uh, uh, coefficient, uh, my correlation coefficient is a little bit less than 0.6. So I thought, wow, that is a um, uh, laboratory known for uh, high precision and value. Everybody knows that, yes. So it is a little bit uh, uh, hard to accept that they only got a uh, correlation coefficient of 0.6. And when you see now, the scatter plot of this, yes, you know exactly what means 0.6. So, and you see now when I uh, take some of the data out here, just eliminate them in this plot, yes, and then we go to the right graph, yes, so then you see my R square. Uh, my correlation coefficient goes now to something uh, larger than 0.8. So, and if I'm you taking my previous explanation on words for grant, 
then you have to ask, is 0.8 enough for a good precision if you use a software uh, like uh, the compounder software? And I will at the end explain somehow why I'm uh, uh, stressing this point. So when we saw our correlation graph uh, crosslink uh, property over crosslink density, yes, then we have a uh, very good measure for uh, crosslink density, and that is the the uh, uh, force in the Vulcameter experiment. Yes, that is the F max minus the F min. Here uh, it's another abbreviation that is. MH minus ML, so that's a, uh, F max uh, is, is MH and F min is ML. So in the modulus 50 is, uh, is measured in this study, there's a lot of data uh, taken and then you see again, yes, that we have some sort of uh, points sticking far out yes and if if i uh, clean that a little bit yes you see, see that my correlation uh, which i now uh, put a lower and upper limit in terms of uh, lines here on the uh, right side were a little bit narrower Yes, and it's uh, almost a good correlation. Yes, and uh, I have to deal with uh, these experiments here to either redo them, repeat them, or actually investigate why they are sticking out uh, to, to learn something about my experimentation and uh, the experiment itself. So if we go now and uh, load the program to show how that works in the graph compounder, then this is this one. Um, you see here the um, screen of the uh, graph compounder and two words uh, to the software. Yes, you have your input data where you have your ingredients column on your property column and you have then now your recipes one by one. And uh, you see that is I put all the recipes in here and I, I take that because from my side, it's sometimes easier and faster to analyze your um, database. In this case, can be small or big. And precision, as we have already talked about, is if, you, if I uh, name this software as a uh, so-called uh, feed forward artificial intelligence software because uh, the mass of such a system is behind that. Yes, then you have no ability uh, at the moment to um, adjust the, the um, uh, outcome, which would be here the output. Uh, when you do a query and you get the, the, the uh, mixture formula here, uh, because we have no machine learning element included. And that is a, a, a big problem in its own. Yes, the machine learning requires uh, big data and very fast uh, learning cycles. So if you see face recognition or something like that, or spell checking, yes, that goes, uh, uh, you can make these adjustment factors and incorporate them uh, 
from fast forward to, to recurrent uh, in, in a way that you have no really, uh, you just have to have patience to put uh, those data in. But in the rubber industry, yes, we have a time between the experiment and the getting results, which are days or weeks or even longer than months. Yes, if you think about uh, stress, strain, relaxation experiments or whatever you think about that, yes, it, taking a lot of time. So to do those training is a uh, tremendous effort. And we don't have that at the moment, even thought about that, how to manage that. So in this case, I try to gain data in a systematic way, that is this one, and then let me say, uh, analyze or make a prediction with such a database. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, then improving my uh, data. So when I do that this way, I first of all can just do a 2D scatter plot as we have seen. And that means I choose, for example, my uh, MH minus ML as we have seen. And then I go and check <clears throat> where is that here? Hardness. Yes. And then you see that you have and a scatter plot like this. And then you can now click on, yes, uh, each point and this way you can identify the compound and then you can go in the compound. And uh, this way, I can now go in my uh, database and that is compound 48, for example, and go here and eliminate 48. That's the last one by a right click and go back in my screen here. Yes, and then I say refresh. recipes and then the point is gone. Yeah, so that's one way to do that as described. So I make that small and go back to presentation. So you, you see here, I have done that. And uh, in this way, when you now go in, uh, the question what, from the outcome of this experiment, what we what we the best? Yes, and you put in in a criteria window your uh, specification, and then uh, you make an, a confirmation experiment. And I assure you that this confirmation experiment is in the ninety five. Uh, percent confidence interval as well as a prediction tool in the DOE software. Yes, and I was also, I had to learn something that of course, when you do a regression analysis and describe your point by a regression equation and then do your prediction with that regression, equation, you have nothing else done, then you have smoothed your data, adjusted all your data to this regression equation here. Uh, and by this, you have taken, by this technique, automatically this, let's say them outliers out. So when we have an, another example, Yes, is, here is the question, so uh, experiment I have described before is 
obviously done in a laboratory, mixer in a laboratory. So they have made 48 batches with that variation. Yes, and then it's the other question is if you use a master batch, would that improve our situation? Because when I'm doing an accelerator investigation, I would then have a master batch and low, uh, incorporate my accelerator systems on the mill, which is another treatment than in the mixer. And uh, the, 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 the question is then, is, is that giving us some relief? So I have here uh, a so-called accelerator screening for uh, mostly the target was uh, to look at the best accelerator system for dynamic usage which is around uh, 220 examples. Yes, with uh, different uh, accelerator, sulfur accelerator combination and uh, uh, sulfur first accelerator, second dairy accelerator combination, um, which you can extract from, from that data. So, and when you uh, put that in a DOE program, you have first of all a hard time to see anything. But when you do, for example, residuals versus run, yes, you might see a type of pattern here, yes, which can become from somewhere, at least also from the operator attitude, for example, to make a break at certain times. Yes, so that is an impression of this data. And you see, of course, uh, the spread here in the statistic, uh, external uh, studentized residuals uh, according to run order. So what we have done here is uh, the sulfur level uh, two levels, 0.6 to uh, 2.5. And then you have uh, all the accelerator known at this time um, in uh, molar proportion. Yes, not in PHR proportion, in molar proportion. <clears throat> so, in, if you do a di diagnostics, yes, you see here actual over predicted for the so-called dynamic hardening, yes, you see a certain correlation, yes, but that could be nonlinear, yes, why the nonlinear regression will you not show any improvement over the linear regression. That was also a little bit. So this this data here are outside this uh, uh, line are not so important for the regression analysis. That's a little bit surprising, but that is uh, statistics now. If we go to the next slide, yes and put that all in the graph compounder program. You see, uh, first of all, on the uh, left side, the scatter plot uh, from the program I have shown. And that is very similar to the uh, 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 tool inside the DOE program um, where you can those, uh, uh, analysis today in in uh, in the version in the newer version as well. Yes, and you see this. Uh, if you ignore the scale for a bit, yes, that this is almost the same. So with the graph compounder, yes, and uh, clicking on all this this. Uh, compounds here by name and then 
going back and forth in the uh, in the uh, data sets, yes, then you can easily identify all the compounds. And in the next slide, when I'm doing that for a portion of this data, yes, where I have uh, sulfur at two levels and only the sulfenamide TBBS here at 1.5 PHR, then you see some sort of correlation here and you are disturbed by this here. Yes, because that seems not to fit. Now, with uh, the ability to click, yes, I can tell you, okay, this here is all at 2.5 PHR sulfur, and this here, all these points are at 0.6 PHR sulfur. Yeah, so the hardening factor here is very, very different than from that, and the correlation seems to be different. So now you can analyze that. Yes, so we have this, this, let me say, cluster there, and we have another cluster uh, along this line. Yes, so that would be a conclusion now that I can say, okay, for a low hardening, I think I made a mistake, just is a higher sulfur and then other um, properties are not that important. And uh, for uh, uh, higher hardening factor, um, we see was uh, 0.6 PHR of sulfur. So let's go to the graph compounder because there's an, another nice uh, thing to show. And that is, I give you first of all, all the results. Yes, you see when you have that screen on your computer now, uh, all the data, and I just scroll sideways that you see how this uh, experiment is done. This is a uh, traditional uh, screening test, at least a large screening test, a lot of effort. And let's go to an, a diagram, do the scatter plot, and uh, select some of the most interesting uh, uh, <clears throat> data here. That is, for example, let's take Tang and Delta, and let's take the dynamic hardening with uh, abbreviation power F. So when you see that, okay, yes, there's a brilliant, yes, there must be a correlation. Uh, when you look a little bit closer in this picture, yes, you see here staples of uh, points, yeah, which you can now, of course, go through. And then uh, you will uh, identify that this staple of points have a certain a, a, a correlation with the uh, compound and mostly with the sulfur level. Yes, and the accelerator used that way. So that ha has you have here probably an, an sulfur level, yes. And then you see that your hardening factor is increasing that way. So you can uh, uh, analyze now every accelerator behind these compounds, which are given here in this uh, small uh, window. And then you can group those accelerator by chemistry, and then you have a certain impression about the action 
between uh, accelerators in this environment with a uh, first and secondary uh, and um, uh, the uh, hardening factor. So that was a way actually to find out what is the best for this. Here I go that, take that out again. Um, and make that small and go up to the folia. So that's, you, you understand now this way, um, what is behind such a plot, which is in this case only the uh, uh, portion with the TBBS and only one accelerator involved. Of course, you see that we have some sort of problem with the scatter and with the uh, with the measurement errors with that trial. Actually, I can say the work was very very good in terms of what we have in uh, in in mind as precision. Yes. For a forecast, uh, in in general, uh, for a prediction is is somehow useful to have a very first idea. Uh, mostly, it needs a DOE uh, with that predicted to learn some sort uh, some more about uh, this predicted compound, and then yeah, judge on your uh, prediction. So if we go to another example, that is an RIR compound. Here I lumped together uh, some sort of DOEs, uh, design of experiment uh, 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 portions in made at different time in the same laboratory. And that is dealing with some sort of uh, a sulfur accelerator combination with some sort of in mind at, uh, at this time we had, for example, worked on reversion. So the very old data from my past uh, position in uh, um, a company which are dealing with uh, ingredients in uh, rubber. So when you do that, yes, then you have a, a tool in a graph compounder with the ingredient frequency distribution. And in this case, you see that we have uh, some accelerator uh, somehow distributed and some uh, are not. So that is a view on your database and when you go to the fillers, for example, here you see we have only two levels of uh, fillers and here's something in between. And here I have only one main portion uh, for oil and uh, uh, um, a couple of compounds with an, a, a smaller portion of oil. So we have a type of uneven distributed uh, database. It's not really, uh, anywhere near a so-called uh, uh, nice distribution of data so that uh, from then uh, artificial intelligence point of software, yes, you have always to jump over large gaps when you now um, <clears throat> uh, do your query and then um, uh, walk your mathematically uh, to, to search for the solution. <clears throat> so how that looks like? Yes, in our uh, correlation plots. For example, here we have uh, uh, Volker meter F max minus F min uh, over modulus 100. Actually, I personally would expect there should be a better correlation. Yes, but it isn't. So then the question is, why is that? Yes, 
okay, we know that in F max minus F main Volga meter value, we have uh, two things which which we see that is the crossing density plus the reinforcement from the fillers. And we saw that it's somehow different. And in the uh, lower modulus, we, uh, let me say, see a little bit more of the uh, uh, cross-link density. What I want to stress here is the difficulty in a Volcameter measurement of the F max, because if that is a marching modulus, then your F max is actually determined when you shut off your experiment of your measurement experiment. Yes, because it's uh, if you would measure longer, yes, your F max will be uh, at a higher value. So if you have not really a maximum uh, in the Volcameter curve indicated by the first derivative and uh, zero, then you have no real, you have an, a measurement problem here. Which was this classical, we had that all the time. And that was discussed extensively uh, inside the companies very often. Yes, and we accept certain measurement procedure, but it is really complicated to deal with such an, an, an factor if this is not controlled. Yes, on the other hand, we have a an, an good correlation if we correlate modulus 100 to modulus 300, for example, and then we have some sticking out here. Yes, which we can then analyze and think about. So if I do that, uh, for example, with a tensile over elongation, I see that um, I'm not sure if if I should proceed with just the database because you see a lot of data are really sticking out. So yes, I analyzed some of them and they were all a little bit exotic, but after my so long time, I would I'm not able to identify the root cause of this and what went wrong with this type of compound. Yeah, and when you uh, let me say clean a little bit the database, you see that your correlation becomes a little bit better. Yes, but not really good. You see this points here moving here to this side. Yes, and it seems a little bit that uh, the correlation in this type of data set is not linear. So when we do and, and, and further example and take an, a normal trial and error study. I think that is um, more of interest than those type of data. And in this case, we have a, a, some sort of a polymer variation. That's all, all EPDM. We have a different, very different uh, sulfur accelerator combination and uh, different loadings. Not too much difference, but uh, some. So here, I, in, in the first slide, uh, from this type of uh, trial and error, you see there is somehow a correlation between uh, hardness and modulus, which I easily can deal with. Yes, because when I, I put some of this uh, data out, uh, then I can improve my correlation quite well. And then I already see, yes, there is a correlation 
uh, uh, improvement this way, yes, with, with the elimination. The remark I have to make is, of course, you need to analyze if it's justified to keep that out. So when you see here a tensile over elongation now, there's a quite nice correlation. Yes, if you eliminate some points, which I would say obviously measurement errors. Yes, and when you go in the uh, module uh, 100 over module 300, yes, exactly these points here are missing here in this. That is very interesting. So that gives me a good reason uh, to uh, go in uh, the analysis of the uh, uh, experiments and or better probably repeat the experiment to verify that this is all justified. And uh, 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 we go again in the program because this is an, one of the most interesting uh, experiments of my uh, last uh, this one. No, excuse me, I need to go. Uh, sorry for the interruption. This one. So what was the reason of this? Uh, trial and error procedure. It was a search for a compound with uh, a high heat um, a resistance to higher heat. Yes, and it is mostly measured with the compression set. Uh, let's go down here. Yes, you see, uh, we have some compression set at 150 C. That was one of the target um, which I which we tried to achieve with this compound. And when you have made your your data, okay, you sometimes have the feeling, oh, I get it soon, or I, I missed it this time, and then I need to do this and this and this. Yes, a typical trial and error procedure. You fool a little bit around and then you hope that you get uh, some sort of a solution. So after you have done this, yes, then you are able to analyze this with uh, software like the graph compounder because you cannot hardly put that in a DOE software for analysis. And we can do those scatter plots, of course, to analyze that data. But here, in this case, we have the criteria window, and I just put all my target, my specification, in this criteria window. And when I do that, yes, then I have an, an result. And you see that here in... Uh, I neutralize that a bit for to protect uh, the owner of this, and that is that we need a little bit of polymer two to actually increase the uh, stability against heat. Yes, and then you see also that we have uh, here. Uh, a compression set at higher temperature. Uh, this, I need to move that a bit. Sorry. Yeah, now it goes. 
This one you see here, the uh, compression set at 150, see the, the range in this experiment is from a uh, little bit less than 10 to 30. I think normal is something around 20, which is quite good. Yes, but here the challenge was a little bit, the bar was a little bit higher. And then all the other uh, aging movements here, you see delta tensile and so on, should be around zero. Yes, and then when you then make your prediction, you come very close to that type of targets. And that is also uh, verified in, in practice. So that is uh, for me a good sign how uh, good is prediction when you do just uh, have trial and error that data. And this, uh, as I said, I want to improve uh, with that type of uh, correlation analysis. Yeah, which I have shown here um, to inactivate the compound in the data set, take them out just, and then work further down the road with, uh, let's say, uh, a data set without obviously uh, data with a larger measurement error. So I hope I have shown you that, uh, how to use that. And I have hope I have shown that we need to pay more attention uh, when we do development uh, to have an, uh, a better view on uh, such data. If you go back uh, uh, in, in this presentation, you see that we have um, properties which are somehow robust and not so dependent on, on uh, measurement errors. For example, the modulus, the hardness, I'm not sure anymore um, because that is somehow disturbing what you uh, have when you uh, uh, analyze that way. And if you go to uh, sophisticated uh, properties like tangent delta, like uh, uh, C static, uh, static force or dynamic forces and, and, and things like that, yes, or in, into aging, of course, then um, you become more and more sensitive uh, to precision. And uh, you see obviously the point that we need to have to increase our precision when we really want to analyze that with any software, either uh, graph compounder software or uh, statistic experimental design. So with that, I like to thank you for uh, joining this presentation. And I foresee uh, a couple of questions, and I'm happy to answer them all. We have uh, taken or, or offer our time here um, for you, and uh, with that, I thank you again. And any question, let me know further, and uh, uh, more information you can uh, get under my website, Graph Compounder. Dot com. So, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Graf. Guys, so if you have any questions, you can post questions now. Or if you'd like to ask questions directly, also, you can raise your hand. So, I let you open your web, you know, your webcam and speaker. Feel free to post any questions you have. If you'd like to speak to him directly, you raise your hand. So I let your webcam and speaker to be alone. So Dr. Graf, in the meantime, I may ask you a question for you. Is it all right? 
Yes. So, you know, you, you have started, can you talk about the development of this compounder program? When you started it, you know, you have like many versions now updated in 4.0. How many people have been using this, uh, <clears throat> this software across the world? Can you give us some highlights about it? Okay, I started in 97. Uh, when I saw this problem uh, to be faster in the laboratory and uh, in critic of an at this time available uh, artificial intelligence program. And we tested that program two years in two years frame. So we put a lot of effort in, but we failed always to predict a compound near to what we thought should be the outcome. And then uh, the critics on that was because in a normal IE program, all what is done is hidden. So you cannot even track back your uh, data set used for the calculation out of your uh, data pool. And, and correct them or take them out. Yes, and uh, IE software, this type, it was obviously a feed forward software as uh, mine is, uh, is sensitive to errors. Because we don't, do not smooth the data, we take the data like they are. And so I ask my programmer, to give me transparency and that anybody can understand that. So with the time of not really 10 years, but in a 10 years time, I had a lot of trouble with Windows, so I was not able to sell that program. So it, it took then uh, 2004, 2005 to first make the first step on the market. And uh, today we have uh, uh, licenses sold over the world, I have to say, in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, we have uh, uh, around 250, 300 licenses out. Very nice. How and the uh, people, yeah. So how is the feedback? You know how they over the part the the users. Did you get the feedback from them? How did you help them uh, in terms of uh, doing things better? Mostly not. Yes, I okay. get a few feedbacks okay. where people are excited. Mostly people who are really in production and uh, needing fast answers to customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, other most people are very quiet and do not tell me what to do. I have a couple of of customers who are trying to develop with me uh, these thoughts, but they never tell me anything deeper uh, inside that has obviously also to do with the uh, attitude that you need first an agreement if you're allowed to say something or not. So sure. we do not trust each other so easily anymore. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, is uh, people are mostly non-tire rubber component people are using this software, also tire people also using this software? At the moment, I see a growing interest from uh, tire companies. Yes, in the past, there was uh, probably in, in my own situation similar. Yes, when I was uh, grown up in industry, yes, we had a, a spot business. And in a spot business, uh, for example, hoses for unloading ships or loading ships, uh, then you need to be very fast to get the business. In this case, we have really no time to go in a laboratory and do any trial for what, for whatever reason. Yes, you need to just make a compound, yes, that your uh, uh, company can sell that. And uh, the, the time frame I, I experienced in the beginning of my career was around 14 days from 
a question, can you do something uh, to delivering the product? So I mean, that's a very short time, yes. So the other question is uh, today, and that is, I think the interest from the tire that they have huge databases um, gained. Uh, and then what can you do with that? Because that, I see that still as an investment, each compound to test in a laboratory in Europe is an investment of uh, roughly 500 euro. And if you multiply this by 10,000, yes, you see that is a major investment you have already taken in your laboratory work. So how to use that is a question I think everybody should ask himself. Yes, uh, to, to repeat experiments. I, I'm not sure if that's the right way, yes. So what I emphasize is when you have such a tool like the graph compounder, you do a prediction and this should be followed by a design of experiment procedure to learn about the value of the prediction and then you are able to make a decision. You know, you, you've been, you know, developing this software with, uh, you know, I remember that you know, version one, version two, version three point something, now version four point something. And um, uh, if somebody purchased from you the, the license, and uh, I, as I understand that you keep on improving your software so that uh, it will be more useful tool based on the feedback or your experience. Uh, if if I purchase the older version, if I want to upgrade it to new version, do I need to pay extra, or what is a uh, what is arrangement like? If you have version three purchased, there is no uh, fee for upgrade. If you have older versions, yes. I asked for a, a small price. You see that on my website, and. Uh, uh, if if I'm, let me say, having enough ideas to go the next step, uh, mostly, and uh, then I already in my uh, invoice, I make a remark that uh, upgrade is then free. So in, in this case, let me say you have half a year ago, version four, and I'm, I'm working on version five, uh, or would work on version five, uh, then I would uh, provide a, a free upgrade. And that is uh, easy to do because the license key, which we provide with the software is permanent also for the newer version. So that we have less trouble uh, to do that. And that's also, uh, of course, that uh, for me that's, the value here that we can then download and then it's fine. So we have one question for you. Yeah, the question is that we are doing rubber profile extrusion. So we have uh, fluctuations in our extrusion process. And we may think as related to our mixing process. Uh, of course, that's EPM if it's, uh, I understand, profile uh, done in an intermesh mixer and uh, a mill, so a two-stage process probably. And uh, I want to find out if our mixing process is true or not. That is a an, an question which comes to me since a short time um, with the idea to use that Graphem Pounder software to uh, analyze in a similar way as I do compound the mixing process. Yes, and I've already discussed with my programmer uh, what we need to do actually to adapt this type of uh, software um, to uh, this type of problem because uh, fluctuation 
in uh, extrusion process has a lot to do with rheology. And uh, uh, there is a strong link in uh, to the polymer and to the linearity of the polymer. Yes, and uh, okay, I don't know now the conditions, but we can assume that um, there could be uh, viscosity fluctuations, which coming one portion with the polymer, the other portion is with the fillers which are influencing the viscosity by a uh, lot to lot variation of activity and the like. And uh, now the uh, EPDM in the intermeshing mixing machine is not that stable as most people think of. So there are changes in molecular weight distribution and long chain branching as well. Uh, we made uh, extended analysis in the past about that stability of EPDM in uh, mixer. And uh, this needs to be have more discussions than just a program discussion, I would uh, guess. So if you like, we can uh, come together that way and then uh, attack this problem. Yes, but the, uh, the uh, uh, is also dependent from the type of extruder and the type of screw you have and things like that. So that is um, a bunch of things I see behind this small uh, question here on this uh, sheet, uh, which I see which needs to address to solve this problem. Yes, it can be solved. Yes, we have, uh, when I worked in Canada, we have uh, dealt with those type of problems and we uh, have uh, seen some solution for these problems de depending also on the uh, extruder itself, of course. As, 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 as Dr. Graf suggested that, you know, a participant who asked this question, if you'd like to have a further discussion, um, maybe we can arrange a meeting, an online meeting with the Dr. Graf, and we can explore the further cooperation together with the Dr. Graf. Is it all right, Dr. Graf, like that? Yeah, normally it uh, works that way with yeah. uh, those type of questions, if, if that... Which require uh, more detail willing from both sides to come together and to work together. Yeah. So, now there is a, uh, like to add one more question for you for the benefit of the audience. You know, a lot of people use Excel sheets and you know, very traditional way. And uh, you know, maybe they're kind of um, uh, skepticism whether this program, your program really useful or not. How can you convince them or what, you know, how is it beneficial if you use graph compound program and, uh, what are the immediate or short-term benefits or long-term benefits for the company? Now, the real benefit I see is that when you have an Excel sheet and a an, an medium uh, database, let's say 40 compounds or uh, 50 compounds in that Excel sheet, yes, mostly one polymer family or one polymer um, and then some some uh, formulas with that polymer. And now you try to figure something out. Yes, that is, for example, tensile should be uh, this elongation should be not not smaller than that, and things like that. So you have your three, four, five uh, targets in mind. Yes. And then you might go with the Excel sheet and find out a, a good solution. Uh, I, I learned that people really use Excel with those uh, possibilities inside Excel. They can do something. Yes. But if you go to a multi target, yes, that you have, let me say, five of or, or, six or seven or even more uh, properties to optimize. And you 
or also look at some certain ingredients uh, which are, should not larger than this or, or smaller than that. Yes, so you also uh, have some sort of, uh, of compound in mind. Yes, then you are better to predict something and see because you can put uh, this all in, you can put the whole uh, specification in my criteria window. Even you can uh, limit the usage of, of uh, uh, ingredients. And then uh, you have this calculation, yeah, and you get a an, an formula out. Yes, and in this way, it is all all the, uh, the properties are considered, all the targets are considered, and you have also the ability to, to make some targets more important and some less important, and you can also say if, for example, the compression set is the most important value, um, that you should will be giving up some of other less important properties. So, and with this, you, you see, you de deal with a type of multitasking a query. And I doubt that with an Excel table, you can do that. I, I really doubt that. I'm not able to do that. So, if you tell me that, then I would give up here. Yes, that's true. So, yeah, we, uh, we are humans and mostly we are one step at a time animals. Yes, we know that. Yes, even we have an, 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 uh, a limit uh, with non-linearity uh, things uh, to forecast. So in, in this way, I think that is very helpful. And uh, what is, is uh, offered, yeah, you can export, import any Excel type of table. So from any uh, calculation, table calculation program, you just copy that in. You only need to then put in uh, certain cells, and that is the uh, ingredient, uh, property, and the recipes that these three cells are in the right position, and then you can uh, uh, copy in and paste and uh, vice versa. Yeah, so that is actually uh, very similar now from the uh, view of that. Um, what I have to say is we had a lot of problem with all the Windows version. And that's why we decided to go to Java. And so it's a Java based program and it is an, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, tools behind is all, all based on Java, yeah, to make you independent from Windows. That was actually the step before I went to the market. Yes, we, we saw that it's not working with those type of, of, of tools which are let me say linked to Windows. Because they are, we are now at 10 or 11 Windows, yes, and just have a lot of trouble with my old version, which is still on this computer. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Graf. Uh, that's all the questions and the discussion we have. And it's a very useful presentation to understand about uh, uh, graph component and also how it can improve prediction of the uh, compound formulation. Um, do you like to add any final remarks to the audience? Yeah. You invite I, them to visit your website. Yeah. I um, first of all to visit my website. I update uh, frequently. I have also an, an, an folder with a frequently asked question, which I update. Uh, to help out and if there's any uh, trouble, you have my email address there so you can contact me. Yes, uh, that is for me and, and type of customer support which is uh, free of charge. 
if it's not a project. Yes, if it's a project, okay, we need uh, to come together. Um, with this software in, in, in use, used by myself in uh, some sort of programs, and uh, here I will update my website as well, I have um, uh, achieved a couple of patents from the solution I have worked out with the help of this tool. Um, and that gives me the ability actually to say it's an, an useful tool and you may take that information uh, if you think about and I believe the price is not too high for such a tool. Um, for similar software you would uh, let me say have another price level. Um, what I not have in that software is a type of management tool for all the laboratory because that is uh, out of our reach as a smaller company. So again, let me thank you for your attention and uh, visit my website and uh, think about whether that is uh, use, useful for you and then we can easily get in contact by uh, internet today. Thank you, Dr. Graf. As uh, Dr. Graf has mentioned to all of you, you can visit uh, for more information on the Graph Compounder, graphcompounder.com. Uh, you'll find how to order or all the frequent asked questions and also tutorials, how to utilize this software. So I'm sure that you, you know, you definitely benefit from this uh, Graph Compounder program and make your life easier. If you're a compound development person, I think this is one tool that you should, uh, you know, have it in your, in your office or your factory. Okay, so please visit the website graphcomputer.com. And if you like to uh, view this uh, presentation, what happened today, uh, you can uh, go to our Technobit channel and uh, you can uh, view this uh, uh, program in a presentation today. Uh, for that, uh, with that note, I thank you all. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Graf, for uh, joining this rubber industry tech talk. And how I'm hoping to see all of you in the next session of this uh, subject. Thank you all. Bye bye for now.